All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number four of our discussion of Morgoth's Ring, uh, which is very exciting. Even more exciting is my reckless projection that we're going to try to get through the rest of the Annals of Amon here today. Um, and hopefully, though I can't promise anything, hopefully we won't be swept away by the story in the same way that Tolkien is so obviously having happened to him. Have you noticed that? Holy cow. Um, think of, you know, that in some ways, actually, I think that... Uh, Christopher's paragraph markings, right? How he's numbered every paragraph of the annals. I mean, it's really helpful for reference sake, of course. But, um, uh, but that the way that that breaks it up kind of disguises from me the fact that like how long it's been since we've had a, a year entry, right? Like how long the entry for that one year, like the year of the darkening of Valinor. I mean, man, it just goes on and on. I, you know, so I'm reading through and I get to the next year and I was like, oh, wait, when, when was the Adam flipping back trying to find the last entry for the previous year? Um, yeah, it's um, not sounding all that much like Appendix B anymore, is it? Um, Appendix B from the Lord of the Rings, I mean the Tale of Years. Um, anyway, so yeah, we're going we're gonna to be looking at some of the examples. I mean, of course, not too much. I mean, I'd have to quote like whole pages, right, to be able to really sort of taste the flow of the narrative and how this narrative really seems to be. I, I don't mean getting out of Tolkien's control. It's a wonderful narrative, but... Um, Moving away from um, uh, moving away from the kind of narrative that Tolkien appeared to be setting out to write here in the annals, um, uh, not exactly a, a a year log, year by year log anymore. Um, but we'll see uh, some of that stuff as we go through, as well as him wrestling with some of these issues, uh, continuing to wrestle with some of these issues that we've seen him uh, wrestling with. So. We're going to see if we can get through the annals today. Uh, quick announcements. Well, quick announcements and a teaser for a long announcement. Um, but I won't give the whole long announcement tonight, so don't worry. Um, and that is uh, the the short announcements. Um, we have a... Um, uh, hang on, let me make sure I remember. I don't want to get the date wrong. Let me look this up quick. Um, uh, we have a, a Signum Symposium next week on the 21st. Um, which is the 21st of April at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and that is uh, our summer class roundtable where uh, the, our faculty from our summer courses are getting together to sort of talk about our upcoming uh, semester. Of course, one of the courses lots of people are excited about for this summer is Amy Sturgis's new Star Wars class, which uh, is uh, being offered live this summer. Uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, if you wanted to join our, our faculty to talk about our upcoming courses, again, that's April 20th first next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. We also have our Anytime Audit uh, quarantine special, which continues. Um, so uh, uh, I, I just want to encourage you to continue to look at that. And of course, obviously, our summer semester uh, that's coming up. Um, and um, so it, here's the teaser. Uh, so the teaser is uh, I am very excited because this is uh, we are in the beginning of a really, really important and exciting season uh, at Signum of a lot of change and a lot of and not just change, though. We're not shifting. It's growth. And, you know, as we uh, uh, begin to uh, spread out and do some more things. So we're launching a major new program. I talked about it a little bit at the uh, uh, the State of the University address last year, but it's happening now, and I'm really excited. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that next year. That's our Signum Path program, uh, which I have mentioned, um, and we're going to be launching that very soon uh, and opening registration. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that next week, but uh, 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 stay tuned for that because that's going to be really exciting. Okay, let us return to the text. All right. I just wanted to remind you about, uh, just wanted to remind you uh, about the orc thing. We talked about this last week, we, so we ended with this slide about orcs, um, and looking at the ways in which this is, you know, one of those big examples that we talked about of how one of the most serious problems that has been 
created, right? As Tolkien is kind of going back and adding this sort of increased consistency, thinking through many of the kind of deeper philosophical and theological issues, making the mythology all kind of work, and especially, of course, work with the story that he's already uh, written here in The Lord of the Rings. And that this creates some significant issues, right? Places where he is... um, uh, places where he's backed into a corner where he has to either make some fundamental change uh, to his mythology or he has to just accept an inconsistency of some kind. And the biggest, one of those biggest places, and honestly, I felt, I felt for a long time um, that the biggest problem of this kind is the orcs. I mean, I think there's no getting around that and there's, there was no real reconciliation of that. Um, uh, uh, really, uh, in his whole life. Um, but so I'm just going to reread this so that we kind of can hold this in mind because we're going to come back to this passage, uh, or we're going to be reminded anyway of this passage. So I want to make sure it's tolerably fresh in our minds as we move forward. But of those hapless, that is the elves by Quivienen, but of those hapless who were ensnared by Melkor, little is known of a certainty. For who of the living hath descended into the pits of Utumno, or hath explored the darkness of the councils of Melkor? Yet this is held true by the wise of Arisea. But this is held true by the wise of Arisea, that all those of the Quendi that came into the hands of Melkor, ere Utumno was broken, were put there in prison, and by slow arts of cruelty and wickedness were corrupted and enslaved. Thus did Melkor breed the hideous race of the Orkor, in envy and mockery of the Eldar, of whom they were afterwards the bitterest foes. For the Orkor had life and multiplied after the manner of the children of Iluvatar, and naught that had life of its own, nor the semblance thereof, could ever Melkor make since his rebellion in the Ainulindale before the beginning, so say the wise. And deep in their dark hearts the Orkor loathed the master whom they served in fear, the maker only of their misery. This, maybe, was the vilest deed of Melkor, and the most hateful to Eru. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> James Oakley says, Redeemable Orcs would be a great metal band name. <laughs> I agree. That is a good name. Um, uh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so... I won't comment on this too much more. The two things, you know, one thing that I couldn't help but kind of sit on for a second as I was reading through are the two uh, sort of flags, right? Kind of narrative flags that this passage is given, right? You notice that? Um, the first was the one I repeated, yet this is held true by the wise of Arisea. Now that could be understood as a kind of um, qualification maybe, or perhaps a uh, disclaimer almost, right? That is to say, maybe it's not true, right? Maybe that's, uh, I mean, as far as the wise of Arisea know, right, would be one potential way to uh, to qualify that. And remember, here too, we can feel the effect of the frame, right? The fact that this is uh, the writings of Rumil transmitted through Pengoa then delivered to Alfwina and brought back home, right, uh, to Europe. So um, this is not an omniscient narrator. This is not, you know, thus, you know, so it is written, right? Um, this is held true by the wise of Arisea, says Pengalov from Arisea, right? Um, uh, so this is, this is what they believe to be true. It's probably true, right? But that first one sounds like it could almost be, uh, as I say, a, a kind of a qualifier or a... Um, uh, 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 a hedge to some extent. The last one, though, the second one doesn't sound so much like that, right? Um, uh, near the end of the paragraph there, um, uh, uh, not that had life of its own, nor the semblance thereof, could ever Melkor make since his rebellion in the Ainulindale before the beginning, so say the wise, right? That doesn't sound like a qualification. That doesn't sound like, as far as we know, or we think this is true, but don't hold us to it. Um, so say the wise. I mean, technically, literally, it's the same thing. But the way that comes across sounds more like, sounds a little more emphatic, right? Um, uh, so say the wise. So 
shut up and don't ask any questions is kind of how that one hits me, right? Uh, so the second one sounds a little more assertive, like, like just trust us, man. This, this is the wise are telling you. Uh, so this is how it is. Yeah, exactly, Stephen. Don't doubt the wise. Who are you to doubt the wise? Uh, it, that, the second one sounds like the first one sounds like it could be, a, as they say, a, a hedge. The second one sort of less so. What's interesting to me is that there are two of those in this paragraph, right? Which that this is not a normal thing. In the Eindelindale, we got more often the that narrative frame interruption where we could hear the speaker, like where Pengaloth would speak in his own voice, even voice his own opinion, right? Like when he started going off about like, here's how you humans look to us elves, right? And it was it was clearly a, a subjective statement, right, uh, by uh, Pengaloth. Um, knowing, like speaking to a human, right? Knowing he was, he was addressing a human uh, and just kind of saying like, just gonna throw this out there, right? Cause this is how it looks to the elves. Um, we got many more of those kinds of reminders of the narrative frame in the Ainu Lindaway, many fewer in uh, the annals. They've not been utterly absent, but there have, they've been way fewer. And we get two of them here in this paragraph. It, it seems that this question of how certain are we about this, right? How, like, who says this? How do they know this? Um, was a question that Tolkien seems to be almost inviting or at least kind of asking himself, right, as he's going through this. Um, but, um, yeah, now, Tomas, I agree. Um, so say the wise is certainly better than some say, right? Or it is said that, right? Um, which is reminding us that this is a tradition that's being handed down and not, you know, the word of God, you know, or like, you know, the words of God written with the finger of God upon the tablets or something like that, right? Um, but, uh, but still, again, so say the wise, still fairly, fairly strong. Um, but, um, but Brian, I, I agree. The qualifier, the first one is really interesting because there is, as Brian says, no obvious way that the wise of Arisaia could know the origin of orcs for certain. So it seems that this could be a supposition based on the more certain statement that Morgoth cannot create. Yes, um, uh, the, the wise, I, it seems, right? Um, the wise would be... Uh, <laughs> what the wise would be in charge of, in, in a sense. That's not the right way to say it exactly. But what the wise would be in charge of is the theological statement, right? The wise don't know what happened in Utumno, right? Uh, indeed, like... It asks that question. For who of the living hath descended into the pits of Utumno or hath explored the darkness of the councils of Melkor, right? So there's this, like, disclaimer there. Not an eyewitness account, right? Like, don't, you know, we, we weren't there, right? No question. But we do, we have been given on good authority this piece of theology, right? Um, and that's why it returns to it with the so say the wise stamp. Right. So what do the wise know? What is actually within the scope of the knowledge and the wisdom of the wise? The theological point, right? Um, that not that had life of its own, nor the semblance of, of thereof could ever Melkor make since his rebellion. So say the wise. Right. And that they could have had confirmed for them. Right. That that is a a theological premise which could very likely have been handed to them by the Valar themselves, conceivably, right? Um, uh, conceivably because many of the uh, wise of Erisea, meaning the Noldor who returned uh, and went to Erisea after uh, the, uh, the battle, right? After the, the War of Wrath, um, that's who we're talking about when we're talking about the wise of Erisea. Uh, people like Pengalov, formerly of Gondolin, right? Um, anyway, uh, they would have been in Valinor, many of them, not all of them, but many of them would have been in Valinor prior to leaving, right, with Feanor. Uh, and so could have some kind of uh, um, knowledge, right, of this. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah. Uh, Matt, you know, it's conceivable that... Uh, that, you know, in the War of Wrath, after the War of Wrath, some evidence was found. I mean, Matt, you know, it, it's interesting to kind of think of it like, um, uh, you know, parallel to like the investigation of 
uh, Nazi concentration camps after World War II, right? You know, like the uh, once the uh, uh, you know once the Allied forces of of uh, of good got in there and and uh, uh, defeated Melkor at the end of the first stage, uh, then you know they were able to you know uncover things and and gather evidence of what he'd been doing. It's not impossible to imagine a scenario like that, but again. It's the pattern within this paragraph, Matt, that leads me to think that that's not what he's suggesting, that they have evidence that they're not disclosing right now, right? Again, especially with how they um, um, pre preface it, like how Pengoath prefaces it with for who of the living hath descended into the pits of Otomno, right? Um, uh, I mean, if the answer of that was only those exploratory parties who did so after the War of Wrath, he probably wouldn't have said that, right? Um, but... Um, uh, but anyway, and again, and the repetition, the structure within the paragraph, the so say the wise. Again, that's the assertion, right? This is what the wise are confident about. They're confident in this theological premise. And given this theological premise, here's the other thing. We have, we have, you know, so how do they know? Why exactly do the wise of Arisaia hold this to be true about orcs and elves, right? And the answer appears to be, one, the theological fact, Right? This theological premise, which they believe and accept, right? And they seem to believe that they have good authority for, so say the wise, right? If you combine that fact with the circumstantial evidence, right? The appearance of the orcs, the timing of the appearance of the orcs, uh, the fact of the disappearance, right? The tradition of the disappearance, the, uh, the, again, the circumstantial evidence that Melkor was capturing and taking away elves from Quivienen, and then the appearance of the Orkor, combined with the theological premise that he can't, uh, that nothing that had life of its own or the semblance thereof could Melkor make. Therefore, ergo, it is held true by the wise of Arisaia that this is what happened, right? That, this, that seems to me the logic uh, of the paragraph here. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, Michael, I mean, I think that's fair. Uh, Michael says it seems like there's good authority, uh, that is for the theological belief, um, but Tolkien is being careful to present that this is not actually a first-person historical account, so scholarly caution is important. Yeah, again, there's all kinds of flags in this paragraph uh, exactly suggesting that, Michael, that um, this does not sound like the solution of somebody who is in fact ready, you know, to set this down as if with the finger of God that this is definitely what happened, right? Instead, we get all of this. We have very sound reasons to believe that this is what happened. He didn't have to write it that way, right? Had he made up his mind that this is 100% what happened, right? Um, and for exactly this reason, he could have said it more strongly. He could have given us, he could have told us the story, right? He could have, uh, and he could have found ways, right, to... Uh, create a, a paper trail for that, right? Uh, some kind of series of, uh, of, of reporting that would, um, um, uh, that would, that would lead to that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, wow, well, George, um, your question about the One Ring is a question that I am in the middle of spending about 15 years answering uh, in another class. Um, does the One Ring have life of its own? Huge question. Can't answer that. Now, my answer is no, but um, I, but I'm ready to be convinced otherwise uh, on that. Um, I, but I, I can't get into evidence for and against that right now because it's too far off the subject, but it's an interesting question and certainly worth um, exploring in this regard, particularly since the sort of the development of the concept of the One Ring was happening at the same time that Tolkien was basically coming to this theological conclusion over the course of writing uh, the Lord of the Rings. Um, uh, yeah, good. Um, yeah, Veronica, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Those are those questions that you're asking are exactly the questions the theological, philosophical questions that are raised by this solution. The question about what happens to orcs when they die. Um, uh, uh, can orcs at any point ever be redeemed? Even, uh, as Veronica says, like a, a, a baby orc that's, like, caught in the wild, right, and raised in captivity. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Um, 
Uh, exactly. Yeah, Matt's accusing me of opt of optimi over optimism in my estimation of fifteen years. Uh, yeah, true enough. True enough. I just didn't want to scare anybody, Matt. That's all. Um, anyway, <laughs> okay. Let's move on. So this is us not talking about this slide, um, uh, which is great. Uh, but as I say, we'll come back to it. Okay. It came to pass at last. The gates of Otomno were broken, and its halls unroofed, and Melkor took refuge in the uttermost pit. Thence, seeing that all was lost for that time, he sent forth on a sudden a host of Balrogs, the last of his servants that remained, and they assailed the standard of Manwe, as it were a tide of flame. But they were withered in the wind of his wrath, and slain with the lightning of his sword, and Melkor stood at last alone. Then, since he was but one against many, Tolka stood forth as champion of the Valar, and wrestled with him, and cast him upon his face, and bound him with the chain and Gynor. Thus ended the first war of the West upon the North. So one of the things that's most striking about the annals to me is as we move through, so the uh, Christopher divided the annals of Amon here into six parts, right? Um, as we move through, especially like from part four, pretty much on, almost from part four on, um, we were... Um, uh, we're suddenly in the published Silmarillion, right? I mean, the entire narrative is almost word for word the published Silmarillion, right? Um, from a at least from the darkening of Valinor on to the end of the Annals. Um, it is very clear. Um, yeah, and of course, you, you know what this means. We've seen this many times before uh, in our study of the history of Middle-earth, right? Um, we saw this quite early with some things, for instance, the description of the fall of Gondolin, right? When we got almost word for word, um, uh, so close to word for word that we could ex easily see the missing sentences that Christopher added himself into the published Silmarillion, right? Spliced in uh, because uh, they weren't in the original, but he needed to add them in order to uh, fit them with other later accounts. Um, so w what we see there, right, is w what we are seeing there is that basically when you're getting that, when you're getting long passages of text from the published Silmarillion, that means when Christopher edited the Silmarillion, this was, the, you know, it, of all of the versions of these stories. So here it's the darkening of Valinor, the, the, uh, the choice of Feanor, the rebellion of Feanor, the kin slaying, uh, the voyage across the sea, the burning of the ships, the, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the crossing of the Helcarax, uh, almost all that stuff, right? The, the making of the sun and moon. Um, uh, for almost all of those things, when Christopher, all those topics, right, all those plot uh, points uh, in the Silmarillion story, when Christopher Tolkien, after his father's death, is going through and choosing versions of the story, because we, we we've already seen, right, without Christopher explaining to us, we've already been able to see that this is his M.O., right, that his M.O. in putting together the published Silmarillion was to write as little of himself as possible, but instead to go through and choose the versions of the story that seemed most finished, most developed, in most cases, the final completely written version of that story um, that Tolkien ever wrote, which in the case of The Fall of Gondolin was way back, right? Like in the 1930 Quentin Alderinwa, I'm pretty sure, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, uh, so, or that's the 1930. Three Quentin Alderanwa. Oops, I'm forgetting the date of the Quentin Alderanwa. I think it was 1930. Anyway, uh, from the early 30s, right? Um, and he never wrote a full version of the Fall of Gondolin again, right? Because of course he didn't finish the one that he started in the 50s. That I wish he did. Um, so whenever you're getting that, when I mean, if you know the published Silmarillion well enough to hear it all start clicking, right? And you're reading through, and you're like, I'm just reading the Silmarillion right now, right? That that's that's just not what, what's happening. Then you know this is. This is, this is as good as it's ever going to get, right? Um, when Christopher said, all right, it's time to do the kinslaying. It's time to do, you know, uh, the darkening of Valinor. 
this text is where he's going to go, and he's going to choose this text to represent that myth, that story uh, from his father's tradition. Um, so the Annals of Amon, the whole second half of the, Annals, of the Annals of Amon makes that cut, right? It rises to that level where this becomes the, the sort of furthest, greatest development of the story. It's the one that Christopher Tolkien chose to represent those myths, those versions of this story in the published Silmarillion. Um, therefore, still kind of catching up with the last uh, uh, three sections, right, as we currently are, um, it's interesting to come to moments like this, right, because this is different, right? This is not the published Silmarillion. Um, and it's interesting to see some of the ways in which it's not uh, yet where, you know, uh, this still differs from the later narrative. Um, so, um, yes, David Erbach, what a wonderful question. Is this the only time we see Manway put forth his power in a violent fashion? Yeah, I didn't even know Manway had a lightning sword. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't make sense, right? I'm not saying he shouldn't have a lightning sword. And I think it's awesome that Manway has a, a lightning sword. Um, uh, and like, not to mention a withering wind of wrath. I mean, that that a host of Balrogs could assail the standard of Manway and the result would be the wind of his wrath lashing out and withering them all and then slaying them all with the lightning of his sword. I mean, I this is a side of Manway we have not really seen, right? Um, Manway fought in some of the earlier versions, but it wasn't... It wasn't like this, right? It was really not like this much at all. And I agree. Uh, Tony says it sounds like Zeus, and Veronica says it sounds like Thor. And you're both right. <laughs> I think you're both right. Um, yes, yes. Um, this is uh, fairly remarkable, right? And it strikes me that this is one of the things that, if we had to point to a trend, that is, like, if, if I had to say, what is the pattern of things in the Annals of Amon that are not yet there, that are not yet at the place where they're going to be in the published Silmarillion? The bits that Christopher's not going to choose, right, to include in the final text. Um, what is the, what, what are some of those major patterns? One of those things that I would say is about the characterization of the Valar themselves, right? And we were looking at that especially in the first half here, which we're getting close to the end of the first half uh, of the annals. Um, and that is, um, uh, you know, all the stuff about like who's Tolkis's wife and what's Este's job exactly and Este's status rather. You know, Nienna's not quite there yet. Uh, for a lot of them, you know, is Uinin one of the Valar or is she not? You know, uh, you know all of those questions that we've been seeing, that seems to be where there is still, like, most room for growth, right? Uh, that's the, the stuff that's still going to change most, it seems, uh, of almost any of the things that we've seen, right? Um, so that's kind of interesting to me, right, that that element of the mythology uh, still seems to be kind of most in flux, whereas the story, right, the narrative, even the dialogue, it's, it's almost there, Right. He doesn't quite know who the characters are yet, but he knows the story, right? That's um, uh, uh, that's pretty uh, pretty cool. Francis wishes that we'd seen more of this uh, from Manway. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is true. Yeah, Marie, exactly. That Manway is sort of more peaceable and less violent. Yeah, we we again, which we, we we never see this in the published Silmarillion. Um, I I I think this is really. I mean, I, I kind of like this uh, side of Manway, um, uh, but um, uh, but but anyway, I, I think it's uh, I certainly again to me the 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 sort of the, the the larger point is interesting. But Jennifer, you are so right. Jennifer Ewing uh, says uh, this is very poetic with the alliteration and the contrasts and repetition. Yeah, uh, even just the the setup and the and the and the resolution, right? Thence, seeing that all was lost for that time, he sent forth on a sudden a host of Balrogs, the last of his servants that remained, and they assailed the standard of Manway as it were a tide of flame. That sounds bad, right? It's not looking good for our hero right there, right? I, I love the setup of that as a tide of flame, but they were withered in the wind. And then the butt, right? The turn on the butt. Um, 
and uh, yes, withered in the wind of his wrath, right, Jennifer, that uh, the alliteration on the W's there, and slain with the lightning of his sword, and Melkor stood at last alone. Um, and then Tolkas, right, honorably coming forward and offering to fight him one-on-one since it's him alone against all the rest of the Valar, right? Um, yeah, no, it's a beautiful description. It's, uh, you know, it's it, there's certainly nothing like, um, uh, you know, immature, right, about this paragraph at all. And I'm not, I don't, I don't uh, mean to uh, uh, suggest any of that. Um, but, um, but certainly this isn't the man way that we're going to meet in the published Silmarillion. Um, so that will be interesting to see how those characters continue to develop. Okay. Um, speaking of things that he was still sorting out, this is during the uh, journey of the elves across Middle-earth to sail to Valinor. Here Indus, wife of Finway, was lost and fell from a great height, and her body was found in a deep gorge, and there buried. And when Finway would not go forward, and wished to remain there, Orome spoke to him of the fate of the Quendi, and how they could return again, if they would, after a while. For their spirits do not die, and yet do not leave Arda, and by the command of Eru a dwelling place is made for them in Amon. Then Finway was eager to go forward. Okay, so, uh, yeah, the accidental death of Finway's first wife... Um, is um, interesting, right? Uh, I don't even know exactly all what to do with this, to be totally honest with you. Um, That is to say, I have a little bit of a hard time piecing together here sort of the status of this story uh, in Tolkien's mind. Or to say that a little bit more simply, this paragraph makes me say, wait, what? (laughs) She plummeted to her death. So that is, the point of this story seems to be that this is the first time the elves discovered their own fate, their own destiny, right? Um, like when Finn, when Indus, who was Finway's first wife, roll with it, just roll with it. When Indus was fin, uh, Finway's first wife, falls off a cliff and dies, Finway doesn't know. He doesn't know what happens. He 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 is, doesn't know about how a dwelling place is made for them in Amon. He doesn't know about the halls of Mandos. So, the sense that we're given here is that like Finway cradling the broken body of Indus in his arms is the first elf confronted with a corpse. Right? Elves have vanished before. Right? They've been spirited away um, by the. Uh, you know, by the Dark Rider around Cui Viennin, but that this is the first dead body that they have um, uh, that they have encountered, right? And Finway's reaction, right? First, he's like, I shall remain with her body here, right? And then Orame's like, actually, it's fine, right? Yeah, it's, she's sort of dead and that's like pretty sad and stuff but she's actually she just she took a shortcut right she's in Amon um, uh, and by the command of Eru a dwelling place is made for them in in Amon so like uh, it's fine so now Finway's like great so now I'm not going to stay with the body I'm in a hurry instead to get to Amon presumably so I can meet her again there maybe or something um uh, uh, yeah, exactly. That does seem to be it, Marie, that um, he's learning how this works, and now he's all eager to get to Valinor once he knows that she's there, right? This alone, right? This alone, um, that element of this part of the story, that is um, the elves discovering how death works, right? Uh, That is not, to me, the weird part here. I mean, it's a little weird, but that's not the weird part. To me, the weird part is, and what I am not quite sure how to fit in, is where the whole question of Finway's remarriage is in Tolkien's mind at this point, right? Um, Because... This paragraph does 
not seem like a setup for Finway's remarriage to somebody else, right? Uh, indeed, if anything, this paragraph would seem to me, at first glance, quite inconsistent with Finway. So it's conspicuous and somewhat puzzling to me that of all of the elves first to discover how death works and what it means, it should be Finway in this way, right? Not in the way that we get with Muriel later on, right? Um, I, you see what I mean? It's just like it. <sighs> Finway is the weirdest example of an elf dealing with grief and 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 uh, um, bereavement that there is in the whole Silmarillion tradition, right? I mean, he is like the textbook book case of weird of bereavement weirdness, um, uh, like such that this the remarriage of Finway causes like laws, right? It's like like if new laws are instituted after Finway's remarriage uh, because it breaks things, right? So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, Brian, I was kind of half thinking that too, you know, um, uh, Brian was saying, good thing the elves didn't get the idea of ritual suicide as a way to shortcut the journey uh, and get to Valinor sooner. Yeah, I was, I was, I was kind of thinking that too. Uh, the more so uh, because, of course, in the Lord of the Rings online video game, I often use suicide as a uh, sh traveling shortcut. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I, I, I will admit that that idea occurred to me when I was reading uh, this chapter too. Um, but um, yeah, so anyway, we'll... Obviously, there will be much more on this later on. The, when I say I don't get it, the, th the thing I mainly don't get is like, what exactly does this tell us about where Tolkien... Does this mean he's rethinking it? The whole remarriage thing or how it came to be? I mean, I, 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 and I just, I don't even know. I, I'm not really sure about that. Um, but James Lebeck, as you say, we'll get more on this question later on. So um, I, we'll just be patient there. Um, okay. Uh, here's Christopher, com uh, his commentary here. The two passages concerning Indus, wife of Finway, roughly written in against paragraph 1661 uh, and then struck out, are notable as the first indications of what would become a major further development in the Valinorian legend, though the stories told here bear no relation to the later narrative. These briefly sketched ideas may have been merely passing, rejected as soon as jotted down, but they show my father's concern with Feanor, feeling that the greatness of his powers and formidable nature were related to a singularity of origin. He was the firstborn of the Eldar. That is to say, he did not waken by Quivianen, but had a father and mother and was born in Middle-earth. The idea that Finway was bereaved also appears, and this is the first appearance of Feanor's name, Kuru Finway. Um... Okay, so Feanor is, in this version, described as the firstborn of the Eldar. That is to say, the very first second-generation elf ever. Um, what, I just brought up this passage from Morgoth's Ring... Uh, it's a little sad that I'm going faster in talking about Morgoth's Ring during my Grifflet stream, apparently, than I am during our Morgoth's Ring class. I guess arguably because I'm being a little more thorough here. But um, I brought this up because someone on my Grifflet stream had asked me about Círdan, the shipwright, and like, how old is Círdan the shipwright? Um, and I said, I kind of suspect that Círdan the shipwright awoke by the shores of Quivien. And, and then I cited this passage because... Uh, you may remember, Cured in the Shipwright is mentioned in this section, this section about the... It's, and it's the first time, because, of course, Cured in the Shipwright is a Lord of the Rings invention. Um, and so now, in the Annals of Amon, Tolkien is writing him back into the story for the first time. Um, so, uh, and he gets mentioned in the... Like, within a few paragraphs of this mention, of this... Uh, uh, the, the place where, uh, where Feanor is called the firstborn of the Eldar. So... 
at, at least at this moment, right, at this time when he's drafting the Annals of Amon, he was plainly and, and uh, explicitly, well, not explicitly in the fact that he said those exact words, um, but he was very plainly envisioning Círdan as being one of the uh, one of the first generation, one of those born uh, or awoken by uh, the shores of Quivienen. Um but anyway, this this idea of the sing of the the singularity of Feanor of the um, the and I, 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 I think I would add um, to uh, well, no, not add to just emphasize um, what Christopher says about feeling that the greatness of his powers and formidable nature were related to a singularity of origin. Right. Feanor is so very distinctive. Right. I mean, he, he is so very superlative among all of the elves. It does suggest that there needs to be something special about his birth, right? And this this initial idea, his first gesture at that is that he's the first, very first elf born. How exactly that makes him head and shoulders different, you know, head and shoulders above the second elf born, I'm not really sure, but um, uh, anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, it is very interesting, James, that all three of Finway's kids are full brothers initially. Yeah, this, this, so we can see a lot of the business of, you know, f- uh, you know, uh, Muriel and Indus and, 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 uh, 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 you know, Finway's remarriage and, um, Feanor, Fingolfin and Finarfin, uh, that's, a lot of that is still to come, right? Uh, and not an essential part of the story from the very beginning. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you kind of like this idea, Matt? Wait, what, the first born of the Eldar idea? That Feanor was the very first kid ever born, right? So, like, that explains his personality because he was, like, I mean, we all know uh, how entitled firstborn. <laughs> Can you tell I'm not the oldest sibling in my family? Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. so if you're the first one of the entire world, like on on the planet, right? If you're the if you're the if you're the eldest sibling on Earth, then you know, like surely that's gonna shape you, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, just good natured teasing from a younger child. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I, the uh, the first the firstborns in the audience are objecting. <laughs> it reminds me of right after we got married. Uh, my wife was asking me. Uh, she was trying to think of a, a good gift for my sister for uh, her birthday, and uh, she asks me. She says, "What did your sister really enjoy as a child?" And I said. Mostly bossing me around. Um, <laughs> but anyway. Okay. All right. Uh, let's, let's keep going before I get myself into more trouble. Um, okay. Feanor, eldest son of Finway, was born in Tyrion upon Tuna. So we're revising that already, right? By paragraph 68, we have a new plan. Feanor's going to be born in Valinor. Feanor, eldest son of Finway, was born in Tyrion upon Tuna. His mother was Beerda Miriel. So we've already changed it from Indus to Miriel. Um, so this is why Finway had two wives from the beginning, right? Just because Tolkien's changing his mind. Now, the Noldor took delight in all lore and all crafts, and Aule and his folk came often among them. Yet such skill had Iluvatar granted to them that in many matters, especially such as needed adroitness and fineness of handiwork, they soon surpassed their teachers. It is said that about this time, the masons of the house of Finway, quarrying in the mountains for stone for their building, for they delighted in the building of high towers, first discovered the earth gems, in which the land of Amon was indeed surpassingly rich, and their craftsmen devised tools for the cutting and shaping of the gems, and carved them in many forms of bright beauty, and hoarded them not, but gave them freely to all who desired them, and all Valinor was enriched by their labor." In this year, Rumil, most renowned of the masters of lore of speech, first devised letters and began recording and writing the tongues of the Eldar and their songs and wisdom. Okay. Um, I... Good. Okay, so... I... A couple things here. Um, one thing, which I... First thing, the sort of 
simplest thing that I would point out here. I really love the parallel between gems and letters, right? Isn't that really nice? Um, it's only kind of um, implied, like it's not explicitly, they're not explicitly connected, uh, linked, those two crafts, those two arts. Um, but I love the implication, the juxtaposition of those two things, um, that the Noldor uh, are particularly good in uh, crafts that need adroitness and fineness of handiwork, and thus they invent, they, you know, first start to mine uh, and cut gems. Uh, and then, P.S., Rumil also invented letters about this time. Um, the way that this whole passage seems to present the mining and carving of gems almost implicitly, and this might be pushing it a little too far, but I don't think so, almost as a kind of metaphor for the making of, for the, the devising of scripts and the making of language, right? And I just love that. I just love that. I think that is delightful, and it, it's something, um, I don't know. This is taking that one little theory, right, a couple steps and perhaps a few, st a few steps too far. But it feels to me as if this sort of shows us something, perhaps, about um, what Tolkien, what the experience of, you know, language making and script writing was for Tolkien, right? Uh, I, it's, the thing that is so striking to me is how the devising of letters and recording and writing the tongues of the Eldar is given almost as like a kind of postscript to the gems, right? Um, which is described really lovingly and in detail, right? Uh, and again, the more I think about the process that is described there, the discovery of the gemstones in the rock, right? Uh, the careful mining of the raw gems and then the polishing and shaping of those gems until their own natural beauty is revealed in something that is a work of skill, a work of craft, right? A work of art, and yet is only serving really to bring forth and augment the beauty that was native in that thing, though hidden in the stone and undiscovered and unappreciated before. Uh, again, that's this is something that seems to me... I like a very appealing metaphor for Tolkien's whole, like, you know, language construction and script writing project. Um, so anyway, I, I, I just really like that, um, like that kind of concept. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly, Josiah, to reduce words to a script is like mining out and refining the sounds of an utterance. Exactly, exactly. Just as the, the gems appear naturally in the rock, so people speak, right? But how do you represent that speech, right? How do you, can you, you know, craft and formulate that? And again, by doing so, only just bring forth and uh, 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 emphasize and even augment through craft uh, the you know, the native beauty and, uh, uh, and, uh, a sort of appeal of that. I think it's, um, really, uh, really fun. Uh, Rachel Draper says that recording the songs and wisdom is a way of giving freely, just like the gems are given freely. Yes, exactly. That's that parallel with, uh, um, and all Valinor was enriched by their labor. That especially as the transition phrase into saying like, P.S. Rumo invented letters at the same time. Uh, that's one of the things that makes the connection even more compelling to me, uh, Rachel, in exactly that way, because it is a way in which these gems can be shared. Right. Someone who wasn't there to hear a thing that was said can now receive that gem. Right. Um, uh, when it was not possible uh, before. Um, yeah. And Jocelyn, I think that it, it that can be kind of extended in some way to the craft of 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 writing, of storytelling uh, itself. Um, uh Yes, yes. So thinking about writing, uh, recording and writing the tongues of the Eldar and their songs and wisdom, um, of which, of course, 
what you're reading is a conspicuous example, right? So it certainly does sort of connect over to those things. Again, when I think about it and I think about Rumil and the gems, I think primarily about uh, language making and, and um, uh, you know, alphabet development and script writing and things like that uh, as the, the closest parallel. But I do think that it can be sort of extended uh, in that way. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Matt says, evidently not shipbuilding, though. Uh, the Teleri didn't share those at all. Uh, yeah, well, I think they'd have given you a ride. Uh, they just won't let you take them, right? That doesn't seem unreasonable. <laughs> but uh, uh, but it is interesting, actually. That is an interesting uh, uh, sort of contrast there. Um, anyway, that's one thing I wanted to say about this uh, and the thing that I was most moved by when I was uh, uh, when I was rereading this uh, before class. But um, the other thing that I... The bigger sort of broader point that I wanted to make, Christopher points out uh, that about how this passage is different from the earlier version of this. Even if I'm remembering correctly, the 1937 Quenta version of this passage. Um, but Christopher doesn't talk much about the significance of that. And I wanted to, uh, I wanted to go there um, because it seems to me an important part. Again, when we're thinking about like, what are the, what's the big picture? What are the patterns that we can see in how the story is developing and where like, what is the current sort of status of Tolkien's thought on this stuff? Um, the, um, okay, so uh, the way it was different, uh, as many of you will remember, and of course, as I said, as Christopher reminded us, is that Tolkien has made a significant shift. The Noldor were always associated with gems. That's old. That goes back to the Book of Lost Tales. But in the previous versions, all of the previous versions, the Noldor invented gems. That is, gems were not something that they mined out of the mountains. They were something that they made. They created gems. They constructed gems. Gems were a manufactured product by the Noldor. Um, so, what is the shift? Why has he, you know, uh, what can we see? What is the direction the narrative is going? What is the pattern here? Um, and how does this fit with some of the other changes that we've seen? Um, and I would say two things about that. First, I would say, again, this is showing how, this is another example, I would say, of how Tolkien is making the narrative of his mythology, right, fit with the world that the Lord of the Rings takes place in, right? You do, in fact, get mines. Like, there are, in fact, mines. It's hard to maintain that there are gems in the world because the Noldor first made gems, right? Um, and, like, that's where gems come from. It's really hard to maintain that when you are... Um, I get this is what this that's actually it's a good example of what I've been talking about when I talk about certain questions that the earlier myth mythology just doesn't ask, doesn't seem to care about, right? The first the early mythologies seem to sort of accept this is the origin story of gems, right? Why are there jewels and gems in the world? Because the Noldor invented them. And some of them they brought with them from Valinor. So, you know, we've if you have a jewel on a ring on your finger or something like that, it's like derived in some sense, right, from the Noldor, right? That's um, uh, that's the kind of concept there. The question that that version doesn't ask or answer, obviously, um, is, well, then where do the gems still in the ground come from that we mine up, Right. Um, did the Noldor put them there? How did they get there? What happens? Right. I, you know, it's um, uh, the early story is not interested in that question. Exactly. It's giving a mythological answer to a, the, an origin question. Why are there gems? Because the Noldor made them. Right. Just as it is doing all the way through. So again, the two things that I said that we can, the two things that I would point to that we can see happening there are first, that this narrative is interested in those questions. This is not shirking those questions, right? Um, 
gems come from, you know, crystalline structures in rock. So that's where the gems of the Noldor came from, too. They didn't make them from scratch. They didn't manufacture them. Um, uh, yeah. The second point that I would make is that this narrative is much less interested in stories of origin. And we've seen several examples of that, too. How interested the early mythology was in, you know, how did the moon get its uh, dark splotches? You know, why do dogs and cats not get along? Right? All those things that we, why does Ireland exist? Um, all of those things that we can get the answers to, myth, you know, mythologized answers to in the Book of Lost Tales. Um, those it's not vanished entirely, but that is definitely uh, getting lesser. Because, again, it's no longer that kind of story. It's no longer that kind of mythology. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, Jennifer, we're not told what the Noldor made the gems of. Um, we were just told that they invented them. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Josiah says the dwarves objected to this origin story of gems. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the dwarves would probably boycott this entire book, right, uh, because of that. But, um, yes, Jennifer, yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. You know, Jennifer says this is more a history of science, a history of technological development. Yeah, yeah, again, it's a more consistent it's more consistent with the history the actual history of our world because remember that's now the frame that wasn't exactly the frame before it was still there was always the connection to our world um in the interest of sort of explaining things but you know the serious with which the seriousness with which that was intended as like literal history um in the past of our world uh, again, like there are a lot of ways in which that's just not really addressed. And that was never the point of the earlier stories. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, Arthur, yeah, the the a kind of a general trend from myth to science is interesting. I. I cannot imagine, Arthur, that Tolkien would not hate that. Um, I think that. Tolkien would object if you told him he was shifting from myth to science. Um, I would prefer to say slightly more because he's not switching away from myth. These are this is still myth, um, but again, he's couching the myth in other terms. Or again, to to say it the way I said it before, he is answering a certain kind of he is interested in answering a certain kind of question with these. Myths. He's interested in a kind of consistency, internal consistency and external consistency with our world and our experience um, that the previous stories just never really showed. He's grounding the myth, Matt. Uh, yeah, that's I'd be a little more comfortable uh, saying it that way or blending it, Arthur, uh, like the light of the trees. That's better. He would not object to that, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, good. Um, uh Good. Yeah, Tomas is pointing out that it's interesting that this is a this is a technology, right? That the uh, the uh, the Noldor are, are inventing, um, but this is a technology of things that have no practical use. These are simply beautiful objects, right? Um, yes, yes. Um, uh, the um, the enriching of Valinor by their labor is the end of this art, right? Um, yeah, it is interesting that we do see technological development. Uh, we do see. Um, you know, scientific progress here. Neither of it is in, you know, what we might call a sharky direction, right? Uh, none of it is very is uh, anything that Lotho Sackville Baggins would necessarily get excited about. Um, it's not about, or Ted Sandiman either. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, let's keep going. Let's talk about the dwarves. In this time also, it is said among the Sindar, the Naugrim, whom we also name the Nornwife, the dwarves, came over the mountains into Beleriand and became known to the elves. Now, the dwarves were great smiths and masons, being indeed, it is believed, brought into being by Aule, yet of old small beauty was in their works. Therefore, 
each people had great profit of the other, though their friendship was ever cool. But at that time no griefs lay between them, and King Thingol welcomed them, and the long beards of Belagost aided him in the delving and building of the great halls of Menegroth, where he after dwelt with Melian, his queen. Thus saith Pengalod. Okay. I have some responsible things to say, and then one less responsible thing to say about this. Um, first, the responsible bit. Exactly. Good, Francis. We can see the growth here, right? Back in the old days, right, even in, like, 1930, when Tolkien was writing The Hobbit, the dwarves weren't craftsmen. Uh, it is my belief, like, looking through the history of Middle-earth as we've done, um, it is my belief that the moment that dwarves became craftsmen was Thorin's song in chapter one of The Hobbit. When the hobbits show up at the door, when the dwarves show, show up at the a door, rather, of, uh, of Bag End uh, in chapter one of The Hobbit, dwarves in Tolkien's imagination are not artisans. They're not craftsmen. They're merchants, chiefly, um, with, a, uh, with a, a, a high opinion of the value of money, as Thorin and company are still, is, as is still said of Thorin and company, right? Um, and it is my opinion that once Thorin starts talking, and how many times have we seen this in Tolkien's stories, right? When a character opens his mouth and starts talking, world building happens, right? Things just come out. And in particular, when Thorin starts reciting his poem, right? Now the dwarves are craftsmen and they always sort of will be, right? Um, but notice, yeah, exactly. They're kind of uh, artless or soulless, perhaps, Marie, um, um, craftsmen here, right? Yet of old small beauty was in their works. Therefore, each people had great profit of the other. How did the dwarves profit from the elves? The elves can profit from the dwarves because the dwarves are really useful, especially the Sindar, uh, are not real good at being smiths and especially masons, right? As is obvious by the fact that the great halls of Menegroth are, you know, the delving and building of Menegroth was aided by the dwarves. Like the Sindar wouldn't have managed that themselves, right? So they have much practical gain. Uh, from the dwarves, and given the juxtaposition there, yet of old small beauty was in their works, therefore each people had great profit of the other, suggests to me that, uh, you know, teaching them a little artistic sensibility was what the, uh, what the elves gave back in trade, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and Jennifer Ewing is asking, what is small beauty? Um, is it little, like, that there is not much beauty, or is it that, the, you know, beautiful things which are small? Um, I, yeah, I think it's clearly the former. Uh, there, is, there is little beauty. Uh, of old, small beauty was in their works, meaning there's, there's not much. Beauty was scarce on the ground uh, among the products of dwarves uh, back in the old days. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Michael agreed. Michael's pointing out that, of course, this is by Elvish standards, right? So uh, the dwarves might simply have had a different aesthetic than the elves, and so therefore, you know, the elves are kind of being a little snooty here in this, uh, um, you know, uh, in this statement. Um, very possible. Um, Michael, I can easily imagine if the dwarves were writing their version of this paragraph, they might say something like, and... Um, boy, were we a great blessing to the elves. We didn't get much out of it, but, you know, wow. Uh, like, we were sure, you know, one of the most, <laughs> one of the uh, one of the kindliest works in the history of the dwarves was all of this generous labor that we, uh, you know, contributed uh, to. And, you know, in exchange, they gave us, well, not much. But anyway, we did it anyway because out of the kindness of our hearts. I can easily imagine the dwarf version being something like that. Um yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, Marie says, by name dropping Pengalov here, thus saith Pengalov at the end, Tolkien is distancing his earlier word of God statements about dwarves and making it now a potentially biased elvish comment. Exactly. Notice this whole thing is framed that way. We start with, it is said among the Sindar, and we end with, thus saith Pengalov, right? So not only is this Pengalov's opinion, right? Uh, Pengalod's version of this story. This is Pengalod's second-hand version 
of this story, right? It is said among the Sindar and reported by Pengoloth that this is what happened with the dwarves. So, yeah, there's definitely, I think, a little distancing going on here. Um, uh, good and Devora, yes, that really important point. Um, in being indeed, it is believed, brought into being by Aule. Um, it is believed by whom? We, this is not, we don't get so say the wise here, right? I mean, do the wise say this or do they not say this? It's, it's suggested that they don't, right? Um, uh, so, okay, there we are. Um, uh, that is certainly distancing there. We don't, we're, I guess, I mean, from the context of the paragraph, if I have to guess who it is who believes this, I guess the Sindar believe it. Um, uh, because this is all stuff that's being, re- like, thus saith Pengala doesn't mean that these are his views, but that he's reporting this stuff, which he's attributed to the Sindar. So presumably that belief about Aule is, uh, um, is, uh, being reported from the Sindar, right? That, it, that it's a Sindarin belief, I guess. Um, but, um, but yeah, we, we have, uh, uh, some, I, I don't know, I mean, you guys, like I, am sort of perking up now every time we see those framing comments, because, yes, it's pretty conspicuous when it, uh, when it happens. Um, and Jennifer, right, that's really good. Jennifer points out this, the interesting, uh, the, 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 the significance of the word indeed. Being indeed, it is believed, brought into being by Aule. Um, being indeed, meaning... actually brought in, or that is, many things are said about the origin of dwarves. The real story, right, is that they were brought into being by Aule. They have, they were indeed brought into being by Aule. So on the indeed seems to suggest this is the real scoop about the origin of dwarves. And then immediately he backs away from it. It is believed, Right. Many people believe that the actual story is that this happened. <laughs> That's not super confident. If I'm Alf Winna, I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm downgrading this to probable, <laughs> okay, at best. Um, yeah, yeah. But Julie, yeah, this is as opposed to being made by Melkor, which was the very first version, right? They were, they were, they were people of Melkor uh, back in the Book of Lost Tales. Um, and their origin was uncertain back in the Quentin Older Inwa and the 1937 Quenta. The story of Aule and Yavanna, the, the, the story of Aule's formation of the Seven Fathers of the Dwarves, is yet to come. We've not gotten there yet. Um, this is one of the clearest directions of that. Of course, the primary place where we had the concept of the dwarves being derived by Aule um, was in the Hlamas, right? In the, the Tree of Tongues. Uh, and uh, the business about Aule making up... Um, uh, uh, Kuzdul from scratch, right? Uh, Kuzdul as Khan Lang by Aule. Um, uh, so we do, we have had hints of that, but the full version, the full narrative uh, of the Aule and Yavanna story has not come about, as indeed, of course, Ents have not come about. Um, within, not within the mythology. They've been, they've happened, right? Ents are invented in chapter four of book three of The Lord of the Rings. Um, Treebeard, and we, you guys will remember this, right? Treebeard the giant as, you know, that when tree men is used as it's used in the Green Dragon Inn in chapter two of the Fellowship of the Ring, um, when the word tree men is used, it's only a synonym for giants, men as tall as trees. Um, and that's how Treebeard the giant uh, is depicted the first time Tolkien, the, Tolkien, the second time he tries to bring him into a story and the first time he ever describes him and begins to write a narrative about Treebeard the giant, he's just a giant like Jack and the Beanstalk. And um, then, of course, Merry and Pippin get to Fangorn and Tolkien has one of those moments, right, where he realizes what a tree man really is, right? Uh, and we get Treebeard the Ent and boom, chapter four of book three uh, in its final form on the first draft. Right. In the topless forest. That's right, James. Yes, that uh, that uh, famous piece of Tolkien scenery that you don't want to Google. Um, so uh, anyway, yes. Um, I, I, ends are invented, therefore, in the Treebeard chapter. 
uh, in the writing of The Lord of the Rings. We've not yet worked that back in here. And it seems that that impulse of sort of explaining how to... So he's not yet, in anything that we've read so far in Morgoth's Ring, he has not yet made any, any efforts at integrating Ents and explaining the origins of Ents because there's no precedent for that um, uh, before. Okay. Oh, wait. Here on um, the irresponsible thing that I was going to say. <laughs> I might as, well, might as well go ahead and say it. Um, this is the first reference to the fact that the dwarves built the great halls of Menegroth. I have a theory. I have a theory. It's irresponsible to say it because I can't prove it. And uh, I will only say this theory is probably wrong. Uh, and I have no direct evidence to believe that it's true. But I can't resist it, so I'm going to share it. Um, can somebody tell me what Menegroth looks like? Describe Menegroth for me and tell me how you know. What does Menegroth look like? Can anyone quote off the top of their head a description of Menegroth? I bet some of you can. What does it look like? If you had to, you know, I don't know, maybe quote a few lines of poetry, right, that uh, could try to characterize Thingol on his throne in Menegroth, how would it go? Yeah, that's it, Rhiannon. You've got it. You've got it. Um, it would, I would, if I had to capture it, it would go something like this. A king there was in, on carven throne in many pillared halls of stone. Right, that, at least that's how I'd start it anyway, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I... Uh, uh, yes, golden roof and silver floor and runes of power upon the door. Yeah, uh-huh. That's just how I'd describe it. Um, you may remember, of course, and we talked about this when we did the Lays of Beleriand, which is now ever so long ago. Um, uh, we're all older than we were back when we were talking about the Lays of Beleriand. But um, Gimli's song of Khazad Doom in the Fellowship of the Ring is a thoroughly repurposed especially that element, right? The description of Moria is completely lifted. Uh, like it's, it's plagiarized. Uh, I mean, it's not plagiarism because he wrote it, right? Um, it's, a, it's a completely repurposed passage of poetry, which was originally the description of Menegroth um, in the lay of, uh, of Lathian, right? In, the, uh, in the, the, the epic poem of, of, the, of the Baron and Luthien poem, quite near the beginning um, uh, of the poem, sort of as like the setting. Um, and it is one of those things that you, when you read it for the first, like the first time you ever pick up the lay of Lathian and read it, right? And you come to those lines and you're like, whoa, like, whoa, this is Moria. Why are we talking about Moria? We're not talking about Moria. We're talking about Menegroth, right? So Tolkien wrote those lines as a description of Menegroth. Then he's writing The Lord of the Rings, and he's in Moria, right? He's in Book 2 of The Fellowship of the Ring. He's in Book 2 of The Lord of the Rings, and Gimli wants to, um, uh, wants to do a song, right? And so he gives him a song, and he decides in that moment... You know, those lines out of the Lay of Lathian, which not only am I probably never going to publish, but it's actually been rejected by publishers on multiple occasions. I uh, might as well recycle that stuff, right? Because I love that. So he takes the lines describing Menegroth and he gives them to Gimli and they now become a description of Khazad-dûm, right? So here's my irresponsible theory. Through that poetic borrowing, right, I don't think Tolkien forgot where those lines came from, right? I think that um, every time he reread 
the manuscript of The Lord of the Rings and got to the Moria poem, he was also thinking of Menegroth, right? I don't think I would be very surprised um, if um, Tolkien uh, forgot where those lines came from, right? Um, so through the writing of The Lord of the Rings, and in particular through the development of the Khazad Dûm poem uh, for Gimli, um, there was a sort of a poetic juxtaposition in Tolkien's mind. I think, I, I think sort of inescapable poetic ju juxtaposition between Minogroth, uh and Khazad Dûm. And the Dwarodelf and, you know, the, 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 the underground mansions of the dwarves. So it seems to me conspicuous that right after he's made that, uh, that link, it's not a logical link, it's not a narrative link, right? It's just like a poetic juxtaposition, a juxtaposition of mind pictures, right? Remember, this is another pattern that we saw so clearly through the uh, history of the Lord of the Rings discussions, you know, through our discussions of the, the Return of the Shadow and the Treason of Isengard, the War of the Ring, and the first part of Sauron Defeated, that Tolkien pictures things in his ear. He's a visual... He, he, he has first and foremost a visual imagination, right? He's always picturing things and then trying to describe them. Um, so anyway... Um, now that his mind picture of khazad and his mind picture of Menegroth have overlapped in this way through that poem that he repurposed, it seems to me conspicuous that the first time he returns to the story of Menegroth, after he does that, he decides that the dwarves built it, right? It's almost like, it's like a, an explanation, right? Not that there needs to be an explanation because the poem has just been shifted, right? It's not an actual overlap. It's a repurposing of poetry, but it's almost like there needs to be an explanation for why it is that Menegroth of old in the Lay of Lathian was described as looking just like Khazad Doom looks, right? Uh, like, why is it that Menegroth and Khazad Doom should look so much alike that they, they should, they should be the same in his mind that they can be, you know, described in exactly the same poetic lines? Answer: Because dwarves built it, right? Uh, Menegroth looks like Hazad Doom for a reason because it wasn't only built by dwarves; it was built by the Longbeards, right? So yeah, like you're gonna, uh, you would go into Menegroth and be like, you know what this reminds me of? Hazad Doom. That's what this <laughs> reminds me of, uh, and I just um, love that. I just love that. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I, again, it's. Do I know that that's what happened? No, no. It is, you know, it's in many ways an irresponsible theory, but I, I can't, I can't shake it. So there it is. Just wanted to, just wanted to, to share that. Um, okay, let's carry on. We're going at a blistering pace tonight. Um, okay, uh, this begins the portion. We we now have officially entered the part of the annals, which are the published Silmarillion, essentially, right? Where the narrative really gets out of control, by which I don't mean becomes a bad narrative in some way. Quite the contrary. Um, in fact, you could almost say that Tolkien accidentally lets this become a good narrative, which annals aren't really supposed to be, right? Annals aren't supposed to be um, a, a, a compelling story. They're supposed to be a recording even a sort of dispassionate recording of what happened in any given year. It's supposed to be a timeline, right? An annotated timeline is what, you know, a set of annals are supposed to be. Um, and this is the moment at which the, the narrative grows into so much more of that and the genre really begins to, to shift, right? Um, and it does not sound like Appendix B, uh, like the Tale of Years at all anymore. Now it was a time of festival, as Melkor well knew. For though all tides and seasons were at the will of the Valar, and there was in Valinor no winter of death, nonetheless the gods dwelt then in the kingdom of Arda, and that was but a small realm in the halls of Ea, whose life is time, which flows ever from the first notes to the last chord of Eru. And it was then the pleasure of the Valar, as is told in the Ainuindale, to clothe themselves in the forms of the children of Iluvatar. And they ate, and they drank, and they gathered the fruits of Yavanna, and drew strength from the earth which under Eru they had made. 
Therefore, Yavanna set times for the flowering and ripening of all growing things, upspringing, blooming, and seed time. And each first gathering of the fruits, and at each first gathering of the fruits, Manwe made a high tide for the praising of Eru, and all the folk of Valinor poured forth their joy in music and song. Okay. Yes, exactly, Marie. It's almost like you want the the um, like an ominous stinger to play in the background whenever Tolkien begins a paragraph paragraph with now it was a time of festival. Um okay. So um this is as I say, right near the beginning of, of when things start to get from a genre perspective, uh they begin to drift uh for Tolkien delightfully again, as I say. Um but of course one of the other things that's really noticeable about this passage is we can see again quite clearly how um, we can see again quite clearly how this is an example of Tolkien's narrative answering questions that it was not previously interested in answering. Right. Um, see the questions he's answering here. He is now assuming that his readers are interested in questions like, um, if the Valar don't really have bodies in the normal way, they're just manifesting a physical form in order to interact with other people. Do they eat? Do they eat? And if they do, do they, har- I mean, it's so like they have to harvest stuff. They have harvest time. And wait, also, I thought it was like always like beautiful spring and everything. So like is, how is it harvest time? Like, do they have non? Do they have winter in Valinord? How does that work? Why would they have winter when it's still a flat Earth and there's not a sun? And and uh, and anyway, everything is always like the noontide of bliss and stuff. Um, you know how like how does that explain how that works? Right, and this paragraph explains how that works, right? For though all tides and seasons were at the will of the Valar, and there was in Valinor no winter of death, nonetheless the gods dwelt then in the kingdom of Arda, and that was but a small what uh, was but a small realm in the halls of Arda, halls of Ea, whose life is time, which flows ever, etc., etc. So w- w- wait, so what? So okay, so they're in Arda, which is within time. So the passing of time is a thing for the Valar. There's one thing that he's emphasizing, right? You know, so he's like, so. You know, boys and girls, in order to answer your very excellent question, you've got to think that some of his kids, and I'm guessing Christopher was not the least of those who were asking questions like this of of his dad uh, did back when he was like reading the Book of Lost Tales for the first time. Um, anyway, uh, for based on uh, what we have from Tolkien about young Christopher, that seems to be very likely, right? Um, but uh, anyway, so... Uh, so here's here's our narrator, right, saying, OK, boys and girls, so remember that, yes, the Valar don't have bodies like you and me, but they are living in Arda, right? They have joined themselves to Arda, and so they're part of the flow of time. So observing the seasons, the passage of time, is still something that they're going to do. So they're going to appoint times for harvest in order to have times of celebration, right? Not because you're celebrating harvest time before the winter comes, as you know, humans might do in later traditions, but because it's important, um, it's important to, uh, um, uh, uh, to, um, you know, give thanks, right. Uh, for the, uh, the, the, you know, the creation and, and, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to Eru for all that he has provided and stuff like, like that practice is sufficiently important that they're going to institute times of festival, right. And they're going to make this happen. Um, and yes, although their bodies aren't like you and me, they do eat and drink, right. So there you go. Um, uh, yeah. So I, again, you can see the answers to these questions, right. That he's interested in these things. Um, Yes. Yeah. Marie says, Tolkien eventually will answer the question, do Valar poop? Which is definitely where this is headed. Yeah, Marie, it's like he almost got there in this paragraph, right? And then he he just veers off from it at the end of the day, right? Like, did, like, exactly. Like, what is the digestive tract of the Valar like, right? We're not quite on that level yet, but that's the direction we're headed, right? That's the kind of, and boy, if there is a question that the Book of Lost Tales is not interested 
it in? Do Valar poop is certainly one of those questions, or a, an excellent example of the kind of question that the Book of Lost Tales does not ask, right? But again, we are uh, we are we are entering that territory here uh, in this. It's uh, precisely these uh, uh, these these kinds of things. Um, but um, anyhow, okay. Um, so. Yeah, now Brian says it's unclear where the concept of seasons comes from without the sun. So this isn't an entirely satisfying explanation. Well, Brian, again here, I, I think we could avail ourselves of the frame again, right? What is this narrative that we're reading? This narrative is Pengalov transmitting the teaching of Rumil to Alfwina, right? So just as the sun was used as a metaphor in the Ainulindale, right? In like one in the in the sea um sea star text of the Ainulindale. Um uh the concept there was that so Alfwina, let me translate this into terms that you understand, right? Um in order to try to explain like the last chord of Eru, I'm gonna compare it to the light of the sun. Um which of course is not done in the uh, in the C and the D texts of the Ainulindale. So similarly, Brian, here you, Alfwina, know all about the seasons, right? So you can think about it like that, right? Don't think about it literally. There's no winter of death. So don't think about the turn of the seasons as you are used to it in your world, right? It's not like that, but it's a little bit like that, right? You can at least use seasons that you're familiar with as a kind of metaphor to try to understand the rhythm of life. The point that he makes about the, you know, whose life is time, which flows ever from the first notes to the last chord, the point is that there is a rhythm of life in Valinor, right? It's not just like every day is just like the last, and there's no, there is a rhythm of life, right? The 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 waxing and waning of the trees and the mingling of the lights, um, but even the passing of years and of seasons. And it isn't like the seasons that you know, Alfwina, but that might help you to think about, to try to imagine what life was like, you know, before the darkening of Valinor. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Kind of like tropical seasons, Murray, but it's not exactly like during the rainy season in Valinor, right? Even that is not a perfect parallel, uh, uh, but certainly better than thinking of a winter of death, I suppose. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, further here, you know, as we start moving more into the genre questions, right? I just, uh, I don't have too much to say about this passage. Uh, it's sort of the comment on this passage, because again, here we're like, we're in published Silmarillion territory, squarely, right? But again, just think about the early por portions of the Annals of Amman that we read, right? Um, and just like, listen to the flow of the narrative here. For Yavanna spoke before the Valar, saying, The light of the trees hath gone hence, and liveth now only in the jewels of Feanor. Foresighted was he. Lo, for those even who are mightiest, there is some deed that they may accomplish once and once only. The light of the trees I brought into being, and can do so never again within Ea. Yet had I but a little of that light, I could recall life to the trees, ere their roots die, and then our hurt should be healed, and the malice of Melkor be confounded. And Manway spoke and said, Hearest thou, Feanor, the words of Yavanna? Wilt thou grant what she would ask? And there was a long silence, but Feanor answered no word. This kind of dialogue and back and forth, and then we're going to get soon after this, like the narrator telling us what Feanor was thinking and stuff like that. Annals don't usually tell you... I. Uh, and also usually tell you what people are thinking, right? Uh, like, that's just, that's just not uh, uh, how things go. Um, you're right, Nancy. Uh, um, Yavanna's sort of trust in Feanor, um, or even you could turn it around and think about it from Feanor's perspective, even like the blindness of Yavanna, the assumption of Yavanna, right? Um, foresighted was he, right? Um, as if... This was his plan all along, right? I made a backup system for the trees. You're welcome, right? Um, not understanding, of course, what the Silmarils mean to him, as he, of course, is going to explain, and as Aule understands, right? Though Tolkis does not. But again, all of this subtlety of, uh, of psychological depiction and of, uh, 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 you know, dialogue and back and forth, 
is we're we're somewhere else now. And again, I'm not saying this is new. I know that many elements of this were there in the old Book of Lost Tales version. I'm not saying that this this story is now this portion of this story is doing things that we've never seen before uh, in this part of the story. Again, I'm just contrasting it mostly to the earlier parts of uh, uh, of the annals. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Arthur says it sounds like something Fanor would say. Hey, look how foresighted I was. You're right. In most other cases, he might have appreciated that as a compliment. But um, uh, anyway, yeah. <laughs> Marie thinks that Rumil would approve of the Q, uh, <laughs> the very fancy Q. I love the capital Q in uh, uh, in this font. It's one of my favorites. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, uh, for those who can't see it, uh, the, the, the tail of the queue is this enormous loop that like dips way down, like two lines below the, uh, the thing and ends, uh, the capital Q in question, the, the tail ends right underneath the eye near the end of question. Uh, so it's, a, it's a very, it's a very dramatic queue. Oh, and I meant to say, um, I, I, this was a very small little disagreement I had with Christopher in reading his notes here. Um, he pointed out that that line about Rumil that said that Rumil was wisest, uh, you know, the wisest of the elf. What's the, 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 I mean, just go back for a second. We'll be right back. Yeah. Um, most renowned of the masters of the lore of speech, right? Um, Christopher points out in his notes that, of course, this text is supposed to come from Rumil. And so he's like, so I guess, you know, Rumil himself wrote that he was the most renowned of the masters of the lore of speech. Um, I don't, I disagree with Christopher there, right? This is not Rumil. This is Pengaloth. Yes, Pengaloth is deriving this from Rumil, but there is no reason to think, uh, or rather I'll say it positively. There is every reason to think that it is Pengaloth who is calling Rumil uh, the most renowned of the masters of the lore of speech. Indeed, what could be more natural in someone who is drawing so heavily on the lore that has been handed down to the elves of Erisea from, uh, uh, from Rumil? Back in Tyrion, um, what 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 could be more uh, uh, natural than for him to add in a compliment like that uh, to his master and the source of his lore? Um, but uh, anyway, okay, um, yeah, good. Jennifer says. Uh, it's when the story took on a life of its own and decided to add its own embellishments. Yes, it, it really. And you can see that so much through this. Again, knowing knowing what we know, seeing what we've seen about how narratives grow, how stories grow in Tolkien's mind, right? The, 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 the ways in which stories kind of take over and emerge as he's writing. You can see that happening, can't you? Here, I guess it's, it's such a... a, a, a it seems like such a typical example of that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's get back to the orcs, though. When Morgoth gets back to Middle-earth and moves into Angband, the narrative returns to the orcs and the description of the orcs. The first passage that we started tonight's class with, remember, came right after the elves awoke at Quivienin, um, in the context of explaining how some of them vanished and were hauled off and telling us what did happen to them, right? Um, now we're getting them kind of more in, the orcs themselves, more in their narrative place, right? These creatures, Morgoth bred in envy and mockery of the Eldar. In form, they were like unto the children of Iluvatar yet foul to look upon, for they were bred in hatred, and with hatred they were filled, and he loathed the things that he had wrought, and with loathing they served him. I love that sentence. Can I read that sentence again? In form they were like unto the children of Iluvatar, yet foul to look upon, for they were bred in hatred, and with hatred they were filled, and he loathed the things that he had wrought, and with loathing they served him. Their voices were as the slashing of stones, and they laughed not, save only at torment and cruel deeds. The Glamhoth, host of tumult, the Noldor called them. Orcs, we may name them, for in days of old they were strong and fell as demons. Yet they were not of demon kind, but children of earth, corrupted by Morgoth, and they could be slain or destroyed by the valiant with weapons of war. 
but indeed a darker tale some yet tell in Arisea, saying that the orcs were verily in their beginning of the Quendi themselves, a kindred of the Avari unhappy, whom Morgoth cousined, and then made captive, and so enslaved them, and so brought them utterly to ruin. For, saith Pengalod, Melkor could never since the Ainulindale make of his own aught that had life or the semblance of life, and still less might he do so after his treachery in Valinor and the fullness of his own corruption. Quoth Alfwina. Okay, uh, first of all, wow. Okay, let's sort out the narrative tags here. Can we do that? That's a really, really complicated. Before we even talk about this, let's try to sort this out. So, okay. First off, let's try to point out, let me try to make explicit again, especially for those who aren't watching, who are only listening, um, the punctuation here. From these creatures, Morgoth, bred and Envy and Mockery, through my favorite sentence in the paragraph, to their voices with the flashing of, slashing of stones, the Glamhoth toast, host of tumult, the Noldor called them, period. That's one bit. This is all one paragraph, but after that begins a set of parentheses. Parentheses. Orcs, we may name them. Right? And the parentheses don't close until quoth Alfwina at the end. So, presumably, that parenthesis, that whole parenthesis, is an insertion, a commentary, not by Pengalov, but by Alfwina himself. Right? And that is the more clear when he uses the word we. Orcs, we may name them, he says. Who's we? The Anglo-Saxons. That's who. Alfwina's people. We might call these creatures orcs. Why? Because orknias in Anglo-Saxon means demon. It's a word for demon. Um, so, uh, so he's saying he... Alfwina, that is, is availing himself, of course Tolkien is also availing himself, of this coincidence between the word orkor from Elvish and the word orknias in Anglo-Saxon, right? That it works, right? Basically, Alfwina is saying in that first sentence, this is a pun, right? Um, the orcs aren't demons, even though it sounds like, the, but we might as well call them orknias, right? Because they're a lot like demons, right? It's it's a it's a it's a linguistic coincidence, but it works. Is essentially how I would paraphrase uh, that first sentence within the parenthesis, right? The first sentence of Alfwina's commentary on the orc. So again, the whole statement in the in the annals proper is these creatures Morgoth bred in envy and mockery through the Glamhoth host of tumult the Noldor called them, right? Now we get the commentary. And the first level of the commentary is by Alfwina addressed to Anglo-Saxon readers, right? To whom he is bringing the teachings of Pengaloth and just, you know, to whom he is transmitting the teachings of Pengaloth from Arisea, right? Orcs, we, we Anglo-Saxons, may name them, for in the days of old, they, the orcs, were strong and fell as demons. Yet they were not of demon kind. So don't get confused. Don't, like, they're not literally demons. Yet they were not of demon kind, but children of earth, corrupted by Morgoth. And they could be slain or destroyed by the valiant with weapons of war. Children of earth, you might say? What does children of earth mean? Is that the same as children of Iluvatar? What's up with that? Remember, Anglo-Saxons speaking to Anglo-Saxons, Right? So he's using a phrase which is not an elvish phrase, which is not, in a sense, a native part of the mythology. Again, he's speaking to his fellow Anglo-Saxons here. They're not of demon kind, but children of earth. So that is a categorization that would make sense to other Anglo-Saxons. Is it a demon or is it a child of earth? It's a child of earth, guys. Right? They're children of earth. They're not demons. Okay, fellow Anglo-Saxon readers, are we clear? So, again, the pun works, right? It's, it's, it's uh, you know, maybe more than just coincidence that the word orc means demon in our language. Um, it works, but it's not literal, so don't get confused. Because they could be slain or destroyed by the valiant with weapons of war, which is untrue of demons. You can't kill demons with a sword, right? Okay, fine. All right, um... Then we open square brackets. 
So now we have another parenthetical bit inside Alfwina's parenthetical bit. But indeed, a darker tale some yet tell in Arisea, saying that the orcs were verily in their beginning of the Quendi themselves, a kindred of the Avari unhappy, whom Morgoth cozened and then made captive, and so enslaved them, and so brought them utterly to ruin. For, saith Pengalod, Melkor could never since the Ainulindale make of his own aught that had life or the semblance of life. Thus, so saith the wise. Right? That, he doesn't say that here, but, you know, he's quoting the wise. He's quoting Pengalod here. And still less might he do so after his treachery in Valinor and the fullness of his own corruption. So, this inner parenthetical part, right, is uh, still Alfwina, but it is Alfwina attributing this teaching to Pengaloth. So, I got this from Pengaloth. Pengaloth told me the darker tale that they tell in Arisea, that they were actually elves. The orcs were actually elves originally, right? Um... And I'm going to throw in the piece of theology that the wise teach, right? And I'm going to attribute that by name to Pengaloth, right? Thus saith Peng for saith Pengaloth, right? But all of that attribution, all of that recounting of the origin of orcs attributed to Pengaloth is still part of Alfwina's own commentary for the benefit of his Anglo-Saxon audience, right? Okay. Um... All right. Now, the fact that he's repeating that same sentence almost word for word, that is, uh, Melkor could never since the Ainulindale make of his own aught that had life or the semblance of life, suggests that Tolkien is planning to shift that passage to here, right? And indeed, as Christopher's going to point out, the earlier passage that we started class with tonight um, from back in the Quivienne section um, is, has marks next to it, which are confusing, but which Christopher theorizes likely means that it was supposed to be cut from that passage. Um, and one of the reasons why it could potentially have been being cut from that passage was because he did it here instead. He wanted, he chose to insert it here and notice just by the way, if that's true, he is we, we were we started class tonight talking about the um, the the dialogue cues, the, the the narrative tags right in that earlier passage. If he's moving, if this is the new version of that, right, if he's going to cut that older that older passage and do this in, in its place, it's interesting that he is seriously ratcheting up the level of distancing, right? Um, uh, the fact that this is all, it's not even Pengalov saying this, right? This is all, quoth Alfwina. This is all third hand. So even the so saith the wise, we're not even going that far anymore, right? We don't even get that kind of firmness. Instead, we just get Alfwina telling us, so this is not a translation of what Pengalov told me. This is my just passing along to you a story that I heard and what I'm pretty sure of. And I'm just saying, so this is Alfwina saying this off his own bat, right? Um, so yes, Marie, I too feel like the trend here from the earlier passage to this passage is one of increasing, increasingly plausible deniability, right? It's, it feels like Tolkien is distancing himself from this story more and more. Um, we already talked about the ways in which it was flagged, framed, front and bottom, you know, top and bottom, in the earlier passage, with things that make it of, if not doubtful provenance, at least not 100% certain fact, right? Here, it is, I mean, it's, reliability is way under 100%, right? Very significantly and, and greatly increased from the last time. Um, exactly, Jennifer says, this is a source quoted in another source and used in a student's research paper. Exactly, exactly. That's just the kind of thing. Um, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, notice he does still maintain the distinction um, between the story about the Quendi being enslaved and corrupted and 
the theo it's the theological statement that he attributes to Pengoloth, right? So that's still the ver there still is that distinction between it is said in Arisaia and uh, so saith the wise, right? Um, that distinction is still maintained. Saith Pengolod. He's citing his source for the theological state statement, right? That still is, of all of this, the most confidently asserted thing, right? Um, but, uh, but yes, the early part, as, as Brian says with comical uh, slight exaggeration, uh, he, uh, Alfwina is saying something like, so saith some random people I met in a bar in Arisaia, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, he's not attributing that earlier part to even to Pengaloth explicitly, right? Um, some in Arisaia tell a darker tale. I mean, under what circumstances, right? And how reliable were those sources? And what do they know, really, right? Yeah, again, so it's, does this mean that Tolkien is questioning, that he's doubting this? Um, is Tolkien having second thoughts or third thoughts, right, about this whole thing? Um, uh, yes. Yes, it seems so. Here's Christopher's commentary on this passage. In the typescript, the passage concerning the orcs ran as it stands in the text printed from the manuscript on page 109, only as far as they could be slain or destroyed by the valiant with weapons of war. That is, it ends after the address to us fellow Anglo-Saxons, and before he starts the, oh, b before the brackets begin, right? Before the parts that Alfwina, still in his internal quotation, is attributing uh, to, f to other people in, in, in Arisaia. Okay, so that part got left out of the typescript that was made from the manuscript. Um, right, the remainder of the paragraph had been struck out in the manuscript, apart from the words, quoth Alfwina, at the end. So Tolkien, going back, removed the quoth Pengalod stuff, right? Removed the some people in that shady bar I went to in Arisaia. Not there are very many shady bars in Arisaia. Uh, but yes, uh, the people down the pub at Arisaia told me this dark story. That whole passage. So the entire part that explicitly says that orcs are derived from elves, he cut from the manuscript and he at least at this one moment, intended the passage to be maintained with only the, for us fellow, with only the, the linguistic, the Anglo-Saxon linguistic note, essentially, right? Ending with quoth Alfwina. And then he, Christopher points out that the typist didn't notice uh, that he hadn't meant to cross out the quoth Alfwina at the end of that, and so the typist omitted quoth Alfwina, uh, ending the paragraph at weapons of war without closing the brackets. Against the first part of the passage, my father wrote an X on the typescript and a brief illegible direction of which the first word might be cut, with a reference to the passage on the subject in paragraph 45. It is not clear what precisely was to be cut, if I read the word correctly, but seeing that he noted on the typescript again against the earlier passage, alter this, orcs are not elvish. It seems likely that the same objection applied here. He rectified the typist's error in omitting the words quoth Alfwina by cutting the words orcs we may name them for, uh, for so that the text reads the Glamhoth, host of tumults, the Nolder called them. In days of old they were strong and fell as demons. This was perhaps done without consulting the manuscript. Um, okay. Long story short, it seems, I mean, Orcs are not elvish seems pretty clear, right? Um, Tolkien clearly is, at some point, having third... Th so his, second, sec his first thoughts, as we know, were Morgoth manufactures the orcs from scratch. The second thoughts was, okay, hang on, theological premise, right? So saith the wise, Morgoth can't do that, so therefore they have to be corrupted from children of Iluvatar, so we're going with the elf theory. Now he's saying, no. He's going back on that. He doesn't like that. And again, I think that we have all pointed out, we have all seen many of the reasons why he would do so, right? Um, do, do orcs have free will? You know, do orcs go to the halls of Mandos? These are exactly the unanswered questions, which I think Tolkien must certainly have been asking. I mean, somebody who is on the cusp of asking do Valar poop is certainly going to be asking the question, what happens to the souls of elves, of orcs when they die? if they are derived uh, from, uh, from the, the, the Quindy. So, 
anyway, that's um, uh, fascinating, right? Um, and totally unresolved. And by the way, when we just go back for a second to look at um, uh, the beginning of that paragraph, that is before all the parenthetical stuff happens, right? What is the actual substance of this paragraph which Alfwina begins to comment on, right? These creatures Morgoth bred in envy and mockery of the Eldar. That is very similar to the original statement made about his making of them. Right? He made them in envy and mockery of the Eldar. It's only replaced, as I recall, the word made with bread. Um, in form, they were like unto the children of Iluvatar. That does not sound like they are genetically derived, biologically derived from the children of Iluvatar at all. This paragraph sounds like he is reverting back to the old idea. With hatred they were filled, uh, and he loathed the things that he had wrought, and with loathing they served them. Um, uh, they laughed not, save only at torment and cruel deeds. They are constructed embodiments of loathing and hatred, an expression of Morgoth's own hatred, which he himself hated. And in that context, when we think about you go back to all those lines which get really uncomfortable in The Lord of the Rings when we think about orcs as derived from elves, all those things about the slaying of your first orc and, um, uh, you know, give me a row of orc necks and room to swing, uh, you know, all of those lines, right? Um, uh, which just delight in the slaughter of orcs. All of those lines become much more comfortable with this description of orcs. It just works better, and yet we still have the theological problem. So Tolkien hasn't solved this problem by any means, but I think we can clearly see him looking back to that, even though in the manuscript he then adds the parentheses and within the parentheses reasserts the theological statement, right? Which seems to contradict, um, which seems to contradict the early portion, right? Um, I, I, I just, it seems really clear how deeply divided Tolkien's mind is on this subject and how he, these two impulses that he has, um, what I would call the mythic impulse, which is the thing that has its expression in Give Me a Row of Acknex, Orknex and Room to Swing line in The Lord of the Rings, um, and the theological impulse, um, which is what gives us Thus Saith the Wise, right? Um, uh, so, yeah, and both of those things are at play, are in play here, and neither one of them has clearly won yet. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, there we are. We are getting close to the end of our time here. Let me do at least one more. Um, because it's picked up on in uh, just picking up on uh, what Alfwina said at the end there um, and the chief difference between what the wise say in this version and what the wise said in the earlier passage um, make of his own aught that had life or the semblance of life and still less might he do so after his treachery in Valinor and the fullness of his own corruption what does that mean? Um, why is he less capable of creating life now than he was you know, a thousand years ago. Um, answer. Dark now fell the shadow on Beleriand, as elsewhere is told. But in Angband, Morgoth forged for himself a great crown of iron, and he called himself King of the World, in token of which he set the Silmarils in his crown. His evil hands were burned black by the touch of those hallowed jewels, and black they have been ever since, and he was never again free from the pain of the burning. The crown he never took from his head, though its weight became a weariness unto torment, and never but once only, while his realm lasted, did he depart for a while secretly from his domain in the north, and once only also did he himself wield weapon, until the last battle. For now, more than in the days of Utumno, ere his pride was humbled, his hatred devoured him, and in the, do and in the domination of his servants, and the inspiring of them with lust of evil, he spent his spirit. Nonetheless, 
His majesty as one of the Valar long remained, though turned to terror, and before his face all save the mightiest sank into a dark pit of fear. Notice how, from a mythical standpoint, Tolkien is, is kind of trying to have his cake and eat it too here with Morgoth. Again, I'm not, not criticizing, just pointing out the two different elements, right? On the one hand, Morgoth is lessened, right? He is, he is in decline. He is less powerful now than he was before. His hatred is devouring him. He is spending his spirit in the domination of his servants and the inspiring of them with lust of evil. Thinking of the orcs, at least like the non-elvish version of the orcs, the orcs are animated by his hatred, by his, they are, his own hatred and loathing is in the orcs themselves. When you kill an orc, therefore, you are slaying a part of the hatred of Morgoth himself, right? In that sense. Um, so he is decreasing. But we have to be careful not to sandbag Morgoth too much, right? This doesn't mean he's a wuss. This does, he's a coward, and he's getting weaker, but despite that, let's not forget that his majesty as one of the Valar long remained, though turned to terror, and before his face all save the mightiest sank into a dark pit of fear. Don't think that Morgoth is becoming less or, you know, is an easily vanquished foe as a consequence of this. Um, yes, he's diminished, but he's not yet defeated, Carrie. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but yes, David, it is true, uh, theologically, that he sp that spent his spirit sounds like he has a limited amount to spend and is diminishing over time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, though, uh, David, I would say, I would remind you that there is a reference to the Valar, the other Valar, um, doing something like that. The Valar are aging. Um, and even back in the old versions of the story, indeed, especially in the old versions of the story, um, the effect of time upon the Valar one of those elements of that, like the apocalypse of Tolkien, like the the apocalypse of Pengoloth, right? Um, that we got at the end of the Quentin Older Inwa, back in um, uh, Shaping of Middle Earth, I think. I always forget which volume it's in. Um, the thing that, for those of you who are there, the thing I talked about at Textmoot, um, one of the elements of like what's going to happen after the end of the world is the restoration of the Valar. Like the Valar will be made young again is one of the things. Um, and David, um, there was a medieval concept that aging, basically like when you're born, you have a certain amount of vitality, a certain, a certain amount of life, right? And then, but like mortality means you have a slow leak, right? Uh, so as life goes on and as you age, your, uh, uh, your mortality is draining down. This receives uh, direct and uh, uh, characteristically comical um, expression uh, from in Chaucer, in the Canterbury Tales, uh, from the Reeve, uh, who's old, uh, and um, uh, describes himself as, uh, the, he describes himself as a ton, uh, that is a, a beer barrel, uh, which is almost all drained out, uh, right? You know, his, his, the, the tap on his beer barrel has been running for a long time, right? And, uh, his barrel is, uh, you know, it's, you slosh it around. It's, it's getting empty nowadays, right? Cause he's old. Um, but, um, uh, anyhow, so that's, uh, so yeah, so that is happening to all the Valar. The Valar, are very, very big beer barrels with a very slow tap, right? A very slow leak. Um, uh, but they, too, are aging over time. That's part of what it means. If we go, we think back to that Times and Seasons quote that we read before about them entering into Arda, and Arda is, is within the flow of time and all that stuff, even the Valar are, uh, are part of that. So all of the Valar are decreasing slowly over time, um, uh, over time you know, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, the Morgoth is on the fast track. He's burning himself up um, uh, in order to do what he does. Um, 
Yeah, David says, I didn't expect to think of the Valar as slowly leaking or deflating. Well, I bet, I bet you didn't expect to be confronted with the question of whether or not the Valar poop. Uh, uh, and how was the toilet paper supply in Valinor? I assume it was enormous, right? Because it was Valinor and paradise, um, which everyone, of course, knows means a massive supply of toilet, pa of toilet paper. Um, but, but anyway, see, look at all these things that you weren't expecting to think about tonight. Um, yeah, yeah. You're right, Arthur. Nienna is the one of the Valar who is most explicitly leaking, I suppose you could say. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Um, okay. All right. Um, uh, great. Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. I think I'm going to end there. <laughs> I don't think there's a really a more triumphant note I could end this class on than that. So let's just stop there uh, before <laughs> before I dig myself in any deeper of a hole. Uh, we didn't quite finish the annals, but we're quite close. So uh, let's go on and start the next section. So do, uh, do please do the next section of reading uh, for next time uh, so we can go on and discuss uh, the next section, you know, leaving the annals behind here, okay? Um, uh, because we are, we're almost there. We're almost done. Uh, uh, moving, moving right along here. Thanks everybody, uh, for joining me. See you guys next week. Um, and, uh, have a great week, everybody. Bye now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.